Okay, this is the fast region. This is the thermal region. Squiggly lines, blah, 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 blah. And you could probably tell the entire history of the development of nuclear energy in this one graph. And I'll tell you why. How much energy did the neutron have that you smacked the nuclear fuel with? Okay, how much energy did it have? And then how many neutrons did you kick out when you smacked it through fission? Two is a very significant number in breeder reactors. You need two neutrons. You've got to have one to keep your process going, and you have to have another one to convert fertile material into fissile material. Okay, look at plutonium. Eh, it's that dip below two right there. That's what makes it so you cannot burn up uranium-238 in a thermal spectrum reactor, like a water-cooled reactor. You just can't do it. The physics are against you. And the reality is you do lose some neutrons. You can't build a perfect reactor that doesn't lose any neutrons. So they looked at this and they said, man, we just can't burn uranium-238 in a thermal reactor. It just can't be done. Well, you know, these guys are undeterred. They said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll just build a fast reactor because look how good it gets in the fast region. Wow, it gets above two. If it gets to three, wow, this is really good. Well, there's a powerful disincentive to doing it this way, and it has to do with what are called cross-sections. These are a way of describing how likely it is that a nuclear reaction will proceed. Look how much bigger the cross-sections are in thermal than they are in fast. How many of these little dots are we going to need to add up to this size? We're going to need a lot. So this is why it was a big deal to be able to have performance in this region of the curve. Those little bitty dots, they're up here in this part of the curve. Okay, this is the fast region. This is the thermal region. Thorium is more abundant than uranium. All we're consuming now is that very, very, very small sliver of natural uranium. But this is not the big deal. No, it's not a big deal that natural thorium is hundreds of times more abundant than the very small sliver of fissile uranium. The big deal about thorium is that we can consume it in a thermal spectrum. That's the big deal of thorium, is that it can be consumed in a thermal spectrum reactor. When you're talking about a thermal spectrum reactor of any kind, you have to have fuel and you have to have moderator. And they're both essential to the operation of the reactor. The moderator is slowing down the neutrons. And when the neutrons have been slowed down, we call them thermal neutrons or a thermal spectrum. In a water-cooled reactor, we use water, specifically the hydrogen in the water, to slow down the neutrons through collisions. The graphite in the molten salt reactor, is that a moderator? Yes, that's the moderator in the reactor. Same idea, except we use graphite as the moderator instead of water. Neutrons go in the graphite, hit the carbon atoms, they lose energy, they slow down. Now why slow it down? That's the difference when you're going from that little bitty dot to the big dot. That's why you want to slow it down. You want the big dot, not the little bitty dot. A thermal spectrum molten salt reactor has to have the graphite moderator of the core in order to sustain criticality. If the vessel ruptures, recriticality is fundamentally impossible. The drain tank does not have any graphite in it. If something happens where that fuel drains away from that graphite, criticality is no longer possible. The reactor's subcritical fission stops, and there's no way to restart it without reloading the fuel back into the core. This is such a remarkable feature, and it really is unique to having this liquid fuel form and to having something that can operate at standard pressure. You can't do this in solid fuel. You do this in solid fuel, it's called a meltdown. That's bad. Now in a fast reactor, on the other hand, you don't depend on moderator. You put enough fuel in the reactor so the criticality is possible even without moderator. In those scenarios, if there's a drain or a spill or something, you need to be careful about what geometries it could get into because recriticality is not from first principles impossible. It may be impossible in the design you've designed, but that becomes design specific. Whereas in thermal reactor, it is just impossible. Outside of the lattice of moderator, you, you can't have a criticality set up. The thermal region, look who's doing the best. Look at uranium-233. Look at that. Okay, look at plutonium. Eh, it's that dip below two right there. You just can't do it. The physics are against you. But uranium-233, on the other hand, okay, yeah, it gets a little better in the fast, but dang, it's still pretty dang good right here in the thermal. Big targets, a lot easier. This fact was not well known probably till about the 70s. There was some data that indicated it, but there was enough uncertainty, even as late as 1969, that the Atomic Energy Commission did not feel like it was 
a safe bet to go with thorium. Everybody who was pushing thorium said, we like thermal. This is the kind of reactor we want to build. And everybody who was pushing plutonium said, no, 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 no. We want a fast reactor. That's the only way to do it. And so what happened is they put resources into the plutonium breeder reactor almost from the get-go. They built the experimental breeder reactor one in 1951. So this was the first reactor that made electricity. Four little light bulbs here. This is a mock-up of the core. This size was giving off a megawatt of thermal energy. How tall is this? How many meters? Eight inches. <laughs> this is actual size. That, that's, no, it's scaled down. No, that's full size. EBR1. This was a breeder reactor. It was designed to convert plutonium into energy while making new plutonium. This was not a light water reactor. This predated the light water reactor by years. It was a fast breeder. This is 1951. No kidding. Enrico Fermi and Eugene Wigner saw the future quite a bit differently. Fermi believed that we should really focus our efforts on the fast breeder reactor. It could have a substantial breeding gain. In other words, it could make more fissile material than it was consuming. Eugene Wigner, on the other hand, looked at these same pieces of information and reached a different conclusion, which was that thorium was a superior fuel and that it should be realized in a thermal spectrum, in a thermal breeder reactor. And this opened up a number of possibilities with coolants and reactor configurations. But thorium, in another way, was a, a rather unforgiving fuel. It did not have a great breeding gain like plutonium had the potential in, in the fast spectrum. You had to make sure that you were very careful and conserving of your neutrons. You couldn't waste a lot on losing neutrons to structural materials or losing them to leaks out of the reactor or, or losing them to absorptions in the daughter products of fission. And thorium also had another challenge. It took about 30 days once it absorbed a neutron to turn into uranium-233. There was a time delay there between when it absorbed a neutron and when it became new fuel. Fermi wondered how it would be that thorium would overcome this problem of the delay from when it absorbed a neutron to when it became new fuel. And Wigner had already seen a possible path forward, which was to do something rather revolutionary, build a nuclear reactor out of liquid fuels rather than out of solid fuels. Wigner was not successful in convincing the bulk of the nuclear community to take the thorium approach. But he did make one convert, this guy, Alvin Weinberg. He was his student during the Manhattan Project. Of course, I had heard about Eugene Wigner as this great, formidable physicist. I gradually became his assistant in charge of the nuclear design. And Weinberg got it. He got the big picture. He got, we need thorium, we need thermal reactor, we need liquid fuel. I see it. I see what we got to do. 